whatever you say. Oh, don't do that. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. It'll be a that's all right. We'll just we'll just start when we start. They're not, they're not here. <laughs> Thank you for doing that. You know we could just put one in and I can make sure everybody picks up one or when they come in or Well and again I hate to interrupt anything you were needing to do. I was just getting ready so Thank you for doing that. You look like the teacher, Pastor Nelson. I am <laughs> that you, a that you, I know, I know. <laughs> and, and you know, I know, we, we may not start till who knows what time, and I, I make a rev it up as I go to get out my 1045, because they said they just got out in there. Oh, really? So, yeah. So, so you're supposed to stop at 1045? Yeah. Minutes. Well, we had 45 minutes, so I assume. Oh, I didn't know. That's I what Andy, I asked Andy right. to be sure. And well, hey, he's the man. He would know. Yeah, he would know. But you know how, when there's something before, it often happens that way, that it's one's late, one's, so it's a little fluid. How are you doing? Good, I'm fine. It's good to see you. What's that? Kurt. Hey, hey again. Hey again. <laughs> time I should go ahead and start or what do you think? It's 10. But well, and I asked Andy, I said, Andy, am I supposed to, supposed to introduce myself or what is the plan? And he said, well, I think we're, he said, I think there's supposed to be some introducers going around. But he said, let's see, I don't know. So I guess I'll just jump in. <laughs> I just introduce myself. Though. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. But, you know, I don't want to get started so soon that then a ton of people come in and you just have to stop. So, otherwise, I may wait a minute or two. Yeah. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. just thinking um, you know that just got out and people are still kind of I hate to get started and then a bunch of people still are coming in so I may just wait a minute or two or whatever so is that okay y'all whatever
can park this over here with you. Just get it out of the way. Just put it behind you there, it's fine. Whenever you think, we'll just, yeah, I am too, but um, we'll sh we can shut the door. You think, or should we leave it open? I was kind of thinking I'd rather have it closed, but for noise and stuff. Okay. You think it's okay to close it, though, when we're ready to start? And instead of leave it open, thank you. <laughs> and I'm kind of right in the way. You don't, you don't mind me being front Do not mind at all. Do not mind at all. Well, ladies, good morning. It's about five after, and I wanted to give a few extra minutes just for those coming from coming down the hall from uh, the, the, the previous session. So uh, we'll jump right in, though, because I know we need to give time at the end to finish up for those uh, that are going to the next session too, and I don't want to run over into that time. And we've got a lot to talk about today, but I'm so happy to see all of you here. Thank you for being here. Uh, come on in, everybody, and people come on in, that's fine too. Uh, and thank you to my friend Sherry for passing out handouts. Is there anybody that did not get one? I think she's covered everybody, and I appreciate that very much. I'm thankful to see all your faces here. I'm thankful to see you coming out to talk about and think about and learn about Hi, friend. Friends, several friends that I haven't seen in quite a while. It's so good to see people coming out to hear about connecting on a mission at this Connect conference. And it's a mission that we heard about, if you, anybody was here last night, uh, that was fervently described by David Shannon in his presentation uh, about the mission that we're on, Disciples Making Disciples. And it was also very poetically described by the blind hymn writer Fanny Crosby who said, Down in the Human Heart. Do you know this song? Think, if you, uh, think with me if you can remember the title. Down in the Human Heart, crushed by the tempter. Feelings lie buried that grace can restore. Touched by a loving hand, wakened by kindness, Chords that were broken will vibrate once more. And that's the mission that we're on. It's the mission of disciples making disciples. And so we're here today to talk about connecting on that mission. And so I'm, I'm happy you've chosen to take your time to learn a little bit about that with me today. Why, on your handout, have I called this study Mission Possible? And I like to do a handout because I'm a note taker, I'm a note writer, and, and I like to give the possibility for people to take notes. If, if that's who you are, then you'll have the ability to do that. But why am I calling this study Mission Possible? Well, I'd like to illustrate why by a couple of things that came across my computer uh, even just this week. The first one was the Kellogg Company, who put out a limited edition cereal recently. Some of you may have seen this story. 
promoting a message that people can choose their own pronouns according to whatever gender they choose to be. And that was shocking. And then in my email, an ad for Carter's. Oh, I've, I've shopped at Carter's since my kids were little, now I shop for my grandkids. But Carter's had an email with a line of rainbow wear for all ages. And tragically, four pictures, beautiful children in these pictures, but four families with two mommies and two daddies. And my heart broke when I saw that. It reminds me of the words of Jeremiah. This is the way I felt, the words of Jeremiah when he said, Oh, that my heart was a spring of water and my eyes a fountain of tears. That's the way it made me feel when I saw those things. And it makes our mission for evangelism sometimes seem impossible, doesn't it? And it makes the question that was asked to Jesus in Matthew chapter 19 when he talked about how difficult it was for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And he was explaining that truth. And his disciples said, well, who then can be saved? And Jesus said these words, with man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. And so that's why I've chosen today to call this mission possible. Because when we run across those things in our emails, and across the news stories that really just break our hearts. We need to know that this mission is still possible. And that's what I want us to do today. I don't want to start on that dreary note and not take us to a better place of possibility. So this mission that is possible, let me tell you and illustrate that with uh, a story of a little girl whose mission was possible in her mind. And only a school librarian would begin with an illustration using a children's book, but I'm going to do it, okay? <laughs> and if you have grandchildren, I urge you, look for this book at the library, at Amazon, wherever. I'm going to tell you a little story about a girl that was on a mission. I will actually, I'll just set this right here. You know, like, like fables of old, those fables and folk tales that we learned as children. Sometimes the simplest of stories can convey very deep meaning. And I was reminded of that when I bought this particular book for my library in the decade that I was at Good Pasture as elementary librarian there. And I enjoyed so much reading this to the children there. It's an award-winning book for its illustrations. It's title is Extra Yarn, and it's written by Mac Barnett. And the story presents Annabelle, a little girl who lives in a dull gray town, and who one day discovers a box of brightly colored yarn. And in this imaginative tale, and through the beautiful illustration, she quits, quickly puts it to use knitting sweaters for various neighbors in her village. Now, the negative townspeople attempt to tell her over and over that she will run out of yarn soon. But magically, because this is a fable sort of a story, magically she never does. She dismisses the naysayers. And she literally covers the once gray town with her bright knitting, even down to the animals and the buildings and the trees, things that don't wear sweaters. But they are now. And naturally, through the clever illustrations, the town becomes warm and inviting because of Annabelle's determination to use what she had. That's why today we're going to talk about a mission that is possible. Because first of all, this first lesson today, and we'll talk about this same mission in all three days. If you can be here, that's wonderful. But today we're going to look at this first lesson. The mission is possible by utilizing your abilities and talents given to you by God. And like the girl in the story, figuratively, the Christian may always have extra yarn in the box of her talents and abilities because in the service of an almighty God, the Christian will find no end of use. The yarn will never run out as long as we're serving an almighty God. There will always be enough extra yarn there. So, 
let's look first then at some obstacles that we have to overcome. And I want to ask you a question. Is it important to be on a mission? Is this mission something we must do? And I think we all know the truth about that. The church is not a, just a spiritual country club, is it? It's the living and active body of Christ continuing his mission here on earth until he returns. And that's what we need to be about. And so, yes, this mission is not only possible, but it's necessary. There's a couple of reminders, and you'll see on your handout, one is in Romans chapter 12, where Paul writes to the Roman Christians and really makes an analogy of the physical body to God's spiritual body, the church. And he says in Romans 12, as the body has members, parts, and all of those members don't have the same function, now, what does that tell you right there? It tells you that in his comparison, in his analogy, the body is a body that's supposed to be functioning. Spiritually, the body is supposed to be a functioning body. And there's also a passage in Ephesians chapter 2 that reminds us of this, <clears throat> that we're a functioning body. We're not saved to then be dormant. In chapter 2, Paul has just reminded the Ephesian Christians that they have been saved by grace through their faith. It's not of their own doing. It's a gift of God. And he reminds them not a result of works, not a result of works, not that those works aren't necessary, but it's not a result of those works. So no one can boast. So it's not a result of works. What does he mean? Because he says then for it's not a result of works, for you are his workmanship. Now, your translation may say a different word. The New English Bible says handiwork. You're God's handiwork. You're God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus. This is where we live. This is where we reside. So in Christ Jesus, we've been created for good works that he prepared beforehand for us to do and to walk in and to live in. And so it is a functioning body. But we do have some obstacles that often have to be overcome if we're going to be at this mission that's possible by utilizing our abilities and talents that God's given to us, these gifts. What are the obstacles then? I think the first obstacle for most of us is probably fear. And if you want to be turning to Matthew chapter 25, we're going to be camped out in that section for a little bit. Matthew chapter 25 wonderful here Bible pages turning because anything I say today is only worthwhile if it comes from right here and that's what I want us to do fear in Matthew chapter 24 where we can set the stage here okay we'll back up just a little bit in Matthew 24 and verses 36 through about 50 through the end of the chapter um, Jesus is teaching about the importance of the readiness and the preparedness for his return. And he illustrates this point uh, through um, a couple of parables. And he's going to extend the meaning of being prepared to include one's activities. He first illustrates this truth about being prepared in the, one, the very familiar parable in the start of chapter 25 where he compares the kingdom of heaven to the ten virgin, virgins who were not prepared. And their failure to be watchful prompted the Lord's careful warning, watch, because you don't know the day or the hour. Readiness for his return. But then he goes into the next parable, starting in verse 14, and he's going to illustrate the fact that being watchful watching for his return, being ready, being prepared, doesn't mean being passive. It means we must be active while we're watching, watching for his return actively. And here's what he's going to say. He talks about a man, a master, who's going on a journey and called his servants, you know this parable, entrusting to them his property. Now, he was honoring them with a great trust by doing this. And it involved a corresponding responsibility to do business for him. What possibilities to show faithfulness to the master these servants had? Wow. To show faithfulness to him. 
to one he gave five talents, to one, you know, gave two talents, and to another one, each according to his ability. So abilities and talents are given according to how God determines them. That's good for us to know because we don't all have the same. But that's all right. It's the way God planned it. And so then he went away. And you'll see that down in the end of verse six, uh, 15. And we also see this. He went away, and after a long time, he came back. Think of this as a period of waiting, a period of opportunity to put those talents, his property, the master's property, to good use. It was a period of waiting, but it was a period of opportunity in that waiting. So you know the story. Before the master came back, the one who had five talents traded and made five more. The one who had two talents traded with those made two more. What happened to the one who had one? Look at verse 18. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid, and I underlined these words in my Bible, his master's money. His master's money. It wasn't his own, but he buried it. He buried it and left it to be idle and unproductive. And it's amazing when you think about the honor and the responsibility and the trust that the master left when he left his talents with that servant, that that stirred no response in him. Left idle and unproductive. No response was stirred there. What a sad statement that is. So after a long time, again, this period of waiting, this period of opportunity, the master returns. And he settled accounts with his servants. And if you look down in verse 20 we see, and beyond, we see that the one who had five talents came forward and said, Master, I've, I've earned five more. Well done. Good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. The one that had done two, the same thing. They were both commended, given more, and invited to share in the master's joy because... They were good servants. But then, look down with me at verse 24 and 25. The one who had one came forward, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you didn't sow, gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid. He allowed fear to override his hope of pleasing the Master. What a sad thing. You know, fear can really grip us sometimes, can it? Even in the utilization of our abilities and talents for the Lord, fear can grip us. You know, back in the mid-80s when I finished college and decided I was going to go work on some master's work uh, in library science, I was really excited about that program. I really wanted to do this. I really wanted to specialize. But I was a bit fearful. I was actually a bit intimidated. And I'll never forget the day that my dad sat down with me and said this. He said, I want to tell you something. I've been where you've been. And he had because he earned a master's and then a doctorate after that to come back and teach for years. He said, I've been where you've been. I want to tell you something. They put their shoes on just like you do. And I never forgot that. And suddenly everything changed a little bit in my mind. Some of that fear began to go away. Some of that intimidation began to melt. And I felt like, I can do this. They put their shoes on just like I do. I can do this. You know, sometimes it just takes talking with someone when we have fear. And that was the person I needed to talk to at that time was Dad because he understood. Sometimes it takes talking to someone when we have fear about use, uh, utilizing our talents and our abilities in this mission. See if sometimes you don't need to talk with someone. In her book, She Hath Done What She Could, Jane McWhorter, some of you may know her name, some of you may have known her personally. In fact, I think her book is out on one of the displays. I saw in one of the pictures her book last night when I was looking at pictures. I have my grandmother's old copy of her book, and it's treasured to me. And Jane McWhorter writes in her book, too often we build prison walls around ourselves. So picture this, stones of doubt and fear of failure like prison walls. Have you been wall building lately? Do you hide behind blocks of security while the master above waits 
for you to work with what he has generously distributed? Is fear of imperfection or failure holding back your hands or your feet or your mind or your mouth? I want to say today, I think fear is unworthy of him. And he waits for that wall to be dismantled. There's another one. And we see in this parable another obstacle, not just fear. We see that in verse 25, but there's another obstacle. And before we look at that obstacle, I want us to see the words that Jesus says and let him speak. Look down in verse 26. Very sad words. When he said, I hid your talent in the ground, but, but master, here is your money. See, here's what you gave me. You, ha you haven't lost it. His master answered him, verse 26, you wicked and slothful servant. What a shock. I'm sure Jesus had the attention of his listeners here. Wicked, slothful, a shocking statement. You see, in his misplaced attempt to blame the master, I know you were a hard man and reaped where you didn't sow and so forth, his excuse was really exposed as a cover for overt laziness. And Jesus is the one that exposed it. He laid it wide open. Jesus knew, the master knew this man's heart, really. The word there, you wicked and slothful servant, the word slothful there, and you may have a different word in your translation, but that word in the Greek language also can mean sluggish. And it's from the verb in the Greek to shrink back. And so this servant's lack of discipline, and this is the second obstacle we're going to look at. You'll see there on your paper. Not just fear, but lack of disciplined habits. This servant's lack of discipline, his shrinking back from active responsibility, caused the absence of even the interest he could have gained on his talent for his master. He could have, at the very least have done this for his master, but it caused him to shrink back from even the least he could have done. You know, it may be a sign of our times, but I read lately this comment and thought, i got to remember this. Someone said, lazy is such an ugly word. I prefer to call it selective participation. <laughs> now, Jesus didn't use that euphemism, did he? He did not use it. Jesus used plain talk. You wicked and slothful servant. Oh, that hurts. That's shocking. But it was plain talk. It was honest talk. And I think we have to be honest with ourselves in the utilization of our talents and abilities. Am I afraid? Do I lack disciplined habits? Is that my obstacle? We've got to be honest with ourselves. In a great little book, and if you ever have, of course, I'm going to talk about books all through this. I know y'all have already seen that. Uh, a great little book that I ran across years ago um, actually, when my kids were little, and I would go down five houses down the road to mom and dad's house um, and get on their treadmill, uh, at that time and at that age, I could read while I was on the treadmill. I could. I, I can't do that anymore. You know, I'm doing this. But I would read, and I found a little book on my dad's shelf and decided I had a little, little tiny paperback. If you ever find it on Amazon, it's, it's, been out of, it's not out of print, but it's an older book. It was written back in the 60s, I think. But it was a great book. It's blessed my life in so many ways. And every few years, I try to go through and read it again. It's by Richard Shelley Taylor, and it's called The Disciplined Life. And in this book, he writes this. In a general sense, he says, self-discipline is the ability to regulate our conduct by principle and judgment rather than impulse or just desire. It's basically the ability to subordinate the lesser to the greater. Principle and judgment in my actions, in my conduct, rather than just impulse or desire. He said discipline character also never wastes time by catering to moodiness. I don't feel like it may at times express the plain truth, but the habitual use of this phrase is the trait of the weakling, not the strong man. He said when a college student 
explained, explained that he had not attended the last class session because he didn't feel like it. The professor said this, young man, has it ever occurred to you that most of the world's work is done by people who don't feel like it? So I asked this question, do you find disciplined habits distasteful? <coughs> Satan desires that. He does. He desires that and he'll use it to keep you unproductive. Do you allow moodiness or impulse or just personal desire to figuratively bury the talent that you could be using for God right now? Laziness is also unworthy of him. And he waits for you to subordinate the lesser to the greater in your life. There's a third obstacle I think we need to overcome. By you in utilizing our abilities and talents, and that is inexperience. And we're going to go clear to the other side. We're going to go to the Old Testament. If you'll turn with me over to Exodus chapter 4. We're going to look at an Old Testament example. Very familiar. Inexperience. What an obstacle that can be. There are people who don't fear. They're not afraid to try. And they don't lack disciplined habits. They've got discipline and order in their lives enough to make God's work be a habit all the time. But they may just have inexperience. They just may not have done things before that make them feel confident. So in Exodus chapter 4, actually backing up to chapter 3, if we're going to set the stage here, back in chapter 3 in verse 11, um, I'm sorry, in verse 7, God has said, I have seen the suffering of my people and I'm going to do something about it. And down in verse 10, he says, Come, Moses, I will send you. Verse 11, Moses said to God, Who am I? See, Moses is going to start repeatedly offering his inexperience up to God as a reason to not follow through with what God wants him to do. Let's watch him do that. First one is found in verse 11. But Moses said to God, Who am I should, that I should go to Pharaoh and bring out the people? Look at his second inexperience. Look down in verse 13. They're going to ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? Then drop down with me to chapter 4. His third attempt at saying, God, I'm inexperienced. He said, Behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice. They'll say, the Lord did not appear to you. In other words, he's saying, Lord, I don't know what I'm doing. Please do someone else. And the Lord said to him, this is verse 2 of chapter 4, simple and direct, what is that in your hand? And of course, we know what it was. It was the staff. And Moses answered that. You see, the modest shepherd's staff may have had experience with animals in the wilderness, but not with the might of Egypt. And so Moses must have been thinking, surely there's someone more qualified. But God said, throw it on the ground and I'll show you what I can do with that staff. And I think the true lesson of this incident is this. It's the confronting of the scepter of Egypt with the simple staff of the shepherd in the grasp of faith. It's the choosing of the weak things of earth to confound the strong, the shepherd's staff. It's the power of God to do work by the most seemingly puny, inadequate means because it's in God's hand and in your hand. So that inexperienced obstacle can be overcome. And I want to ask today, what is in your hand? I think that's the question that God would ask every one of us. You see, lack of experience can be a small obstacle in the exercise of our abilities and talents when an all-powerful God can be a part of it because He can take that experience and not only help you acquire it, but multiply it. You know, 
I think if we're going to overcome these obstacles, we've got to replace it with something. And hopefully that's what we can do when we overcome these in our lives. We've got to replace it with something. We've got to replace it with some attitudes. And these obstacles can be kind of like weeds in a garden. So in the garden of our lives, we've got these weeds growing. What can we cultivate to replace them? I think we can take a little lesson from farming. I read about this recently. It's something called the smother effect. And in agriculture, there's a term called cover crop smother effect. And the idea is to use a, a cover crop like a rye or certain kinds of clover. How many of you have got clover in your yard right now? Every time you cut your grass, you see the little white things. They either don't get mowed down or they're still everywhere the next day. You know how that stuff spreads. Certain types of clover or rye can be grown to compete with the weeds and help them to not complete or, or, or keep them from completing their life cycle. And it literally smothers the bad. What can we cultivate in our lives when the obstacles are there like weeds and we want to overcome them? I think there's some attitudes that we can cultivate. I'm going to check my time here right now, see how we're doing. All right. Look down on your paper and you'll see some of these attitudes. The first one I'm calling a boldness to serve. A boldness to serve. If you'll turn over to Matthew 25 again, where we, we were in, in 24, we're going to look just a little further down from where we were just a few minutes ago. And we're going to see where Jesus was talking about something that I believe with all my heart can give you boldness. I know you want to serve. We all do. But sometimes we just need the attitude of boldness in our lives. Jesus is talking about a judgment scene. He's picturing a judgment scene at the end of time. And the Father says, Come, blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from, from the foundation of the world. And Jesus said, For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. And, and, and people listening to him are saying, Lord, when did we do this? When did we do these things? I don't, I don't remember that happening. He says, when you have done it to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it to me. I believe we can cultivate a boldness in our lives to serve when we remember the Lord's own words. You have done it to me. Whatever I'm out there doing, whatever I'm doing with my talents and abilities for the kingdom, whatever kind of mission I'm on that I believe is possible because I'm going to use these talents and abilities he's given me, I'm doing it for him and to him. That'll give me boldness. Surely it will. You know, we can rid ourselves of the fear obstacle by boldly cultivating this attitude. And Paul described it in Romans chapter 6 and verse 13 when he said, Offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. That will make you bold. You have done it to me. There's another attitude I think we can cultivate. And I call it the diligence to imitate. Look over with me at Hebrews chapter 6. <clears throat> it's the diligence to imitate a certain group that we see described in Hebrews chapter 6. And if I've got this boldness, if I've started with the idea that whatever I do, with these abilities and talents that God's placed inside of me, I'm doing it to Him when I use those. And I've cultivated that boldness. And then I, I keep it in place with this diligence. I think it will really take us where we want to be. The diligence to imitate this certain group, you'll see down in verses 10 through 12, uh, Paul had, been, had written to these Christians and said earlier, he had talked in, earlier in the chapter actually, about some who had tasted the goodness of God but then had fallen away. And he says down in verse 9, he says, you know, we're speaking about these people, but, but we feel sure of better things about you. And they're things that belong to your salvation. We're, we're believing better about you and we know it's headed toward your salvation for he said why do we feel this way verse 10 and that's the reason the word for means here's the reason 
God is not so unjust as to overlook your work and the love you've shown for his name and serving the saints, as you still do. And we desire each one of you, verse 11, to show the same earnestness. Your Bible might say diligence. Does anybody have the word diligence? Okay. Mine has earnestness. Anybody have another word besides either of those two? Diligence or earnestness. The word in the Greek is spude, S-P-O-U-D-E. That's a word I want to learn. That's a word I want to keep in front of my mind's eye all the time. It's from the word for doing something even with haste or speed. Something you're so diligent and earnest to do that you do it with haste and you do it with speed. You're energetic to do it. We desire each one of you to show the same earnestness, to have the full assurance of hope until the end. You're, so so your, your assurance of this hope will go all the way to its end. So that you may not be sluggish. Wait a minute, where have we heard that? Lack of disciplined habits, you lazy servant. This diligence that we can cultivate in our lives to imitate this group we're fixing to see in the next words can overcome the undisciplined habits in our lives. Listen to what the writer of Hebrews says, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience, through the faith that they had and the patience where they kept on going, inherit the promises. That is the motivation, ladies, for spiritual sluggishness. An inheritance promised to the faithful. Isn't that a great motivation to keep us from being lazy, from being just sluggish, from being slothful in the utilization of our talents and abilities? An inheritance promised to the faithful. And I can be in that circle with those folks that he describes. We want to imitate those. I saw a cartoon the other day that was funny to me. And it was a picture of a father and a son standing in a driveway and looking at a house. And the father says, son, someday all this will be yours. But in the second frame, it was a picture of an open garage with all the stuff from the attic inside of it. And I know, I've read enough in our day and time to know most kids today, I can attest to this, they don't want everything in my attic. Son, someday all this will be yours. This is an inheritance that you want. This is an inheritance that you do not want to miss. It is an inheritance that in 1 Peter 1, Peter writes, is one that will never spoil or fade and is reserved in heaven for you. So let's have this diligence to imitate those and be in the same circle of faith as they are who are going to inherit the promises. That diligence is an attitude that will help me overcome the obstacle of sluggishness. Well, there's one last attitude I want to talk about. Not just boldness. You've done it to me. That'll give me boldness to know I'm doing that. Not just diligence to imitate some people and be in the same circle as they where we all inherit the promises this great inheritance, but a willingness to learn. Because what was the last obstacle we talked about? It was inexperience. You can overcome the obstacle of experience with a willingness to learn. Ladies, it's, it's one of the reasons we're here today. It's one of the reasons for this conference. The willingness to learn. You are showing your willingness to learn by being here right now and by attending these great classes and listening to these speakers that we have this week. Look with me at 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and let's see if we don't see this truth spelled out for us. A willingness to learn. And we're going to apply it differently than you might see it looks on the surface, okay? 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and Paul has just written to the uh, Corinthian church about their participation and sending a gift for the, uh, a collection for the Christians in Jerusalem. And he had talked about in verse 6 where those who sow sparingly are going to also reap sparingly. And if you sow bountifully, you'll reap bountifully. Each one has to do what they decide in their heart, he says. But he ends up with this great truth. Look with me at verse 8. 
And God is able. I underline those words in my Bible because I want to really remember them. What is He able to do? God is able to make all grace abound to you. He has enough grace and He's able to make it abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. Now, the specific context here is their giving. We just talked about that. But ladies, there are many kinds of giving, right? Your talents, your abilities... Surely this promise will extend to our learning as well. God is able, because of His grace, He can make it abound to you that you'll have all sufficiency. Surely, surely that will apply to our learning and that will keep an experience from being an obstacle in utilizing your abilities and your talents in this great mission that is possible. And it will help you believe that it's possible. I want to end up talking about a lady who learned that some things that seem impossible are possible. It's a name you've probably heard since you were a small child. Helen Keller. I ran across actually a YouTube video recently, and I was so glad to find it. She has always fascinated me, her story. How many of you have ever read The Story of My Life by Helen Keller? Anybody? Okay, some of you have read that. You've read the details of what she overcame, the impossible. But I ran across this video. If you, if you ever have the desire to look it up, it will be worth your while. I say it's a video. It was some kind of, I don't even know how they had the ability to do this very well in 1929, but it was made in 1929. And it is Helen Keller and Ann Sullivan. Now, you know who she was, her teacher. And if you've seen the movie The Miracle Worker, the water pump, the moment that she connected, that this signing in the hand stood for something, that beautiful moment in that movie. Helen Keller and her, and these were in, uh, these were in later years. She wasn't a child anymore. She was an adult. But her teacher, Ann Sullivan, was in this little bit of video with her. And, of course, she had been blind and deaf and mute since the age of 19 months from an illness. There was no way she could communicate with those around her except at first with a few imitative signs. Uh, She said that push meant go and a pull meant come. And, And she didn't have a whole lot else. But she knew, uh, Helen's teacher Ann said, Helen knew that others didn't use their hands when they talked to each other. And so Ann Sullivan let Helen see by helping her place her hand upon her face and she said how other people talked with their mouths. And here's how she did it. She allowed her to feel the vibrations of the spoken word by putting her hand on her face. They experimented and put the thumb on the throat, she said, right at the larynx. And there she could hear a hard G and a K sound. She could feel that vibration. The thumb on the throat at the larynx, the second one on the lips, and the third here beside the nose. So Helen would put her hand this way on her teacher's face. As she spoke words, the hard G and the K sound she could detect here. The B and the P sound on her lips, uh, with her finger on her lips here. And the third beside the nose here, she could get those nasal sounds, the N and the M. And by feeling the vibrations of the spoken word, she instantly spelled in her teacher's hand, I want to talk with my mouth. It seemed impossible. She had never since she was a baby heard a word spoken or seen lips forming one, ever. It seemed impossible. But after experimenting for a while, the first uh, first word she learned was it. The I sound, she could say that. Never heard it before. The T sound, she could say that, and she learned the word it. 
And after seven lessons, she was able to speak the sentence with her hand on her teacher's face, mimicking the sentence after her teacher. And using the term common at that time for mute, she was able to speak this sentence, I am not dumb now. By learning this new skill, the impossible became possible for Helen Keller. And you can see other things on a place like YouTube, uh, other videos where as an adult she was talking. She was hard to understand, but she learned to do it. It became possible. I hope today, ladies, this has been helpful for you to learn that in the mission that we have, there is possibility, even in a dark world where we see things that come across our, our minds every day that just want us to cry. This mission is still possible because we've got obstacles that we can overcome and we've got attitudes that we can cultivate. And I pray God helps us to do that. Thank you so much for your kind attention today. I appreciate your being here.